Like a dog on a leash. <laughs> you see, that's how I see it as a... All of you can ask me questions and then I will go into the subject. Otherwise, you know, I can talk about cows, I can talk about Egypt, I can talk... I mean, I have to know what, um, what you are interested in. I can tell a lot about cows. Why? What do I like? I, I, I would like to... I would like to... Uh, uh, lie under a tree somewhere in some uh, in the grass you know and uh, and not to talk and not to make films and not to be anywhere but to lie and look at the sky and that's all i need now if but if you need something i'm here at your disposal i have collected in my life a lot of unnecessary for me information uh, which I'm willing to share with others. Uh, but I have to know what you are interested in because my life has been... Uh, there are many branches to my life tree. Uh, uh, Cinema is not everything. Ah, new American cinema. The term new American cinema came into existence only around 1959, but the beginnings of the American experimental, that was the first term, experimental, <laughs> begins already in 1921-22 with the work of Ralph Steiner and Workerpitch and with Manhattan. Between 1920 and 1940 there is very, very little. Uh, you, we can count those films on our fingers. But beginning 1939, 1940, 41, we find people like Harry Smith, Curtis Harrington, and Kenneth Anger, and Gregory Markopoulos, and Whitney Brothers, and James Broughton, and Sidney Peterson. It began on the, strangely enough, on the West Coast, not in New York, uh, San Francisco. Even Maya Deren's first film was made in Los Angeles, not in New York. And they have seen already the French and German Dadaists and Surrealists immediately before the war, during the war, a good number of French, German Dadaists and Surrealists, from you know Hans Richter to Marcel Duchamp to Max Ernst and then Frederick Kiesler, <clears throat> came and lived in New York. Some spent some time in San Francisco. And these brought, that was in 1939, 1940, 41, <clears throat> these brought in a uh, new uh, spirit. I mean, those artists, surrealists, others, no, they were no longer that productive, but their presence there and their minds were still there. 
and it was contagious. I think that some of the inspiration came by being in contact with these, with with the French um, uh, German Dadaist surrealist uh, artists and poets present in on New York art art scene in New York. We had Willard Maas, Marie Mencken in the late 50s, Carmen Davino, Maya Deren, Len Lai. And Maya Deren was very close to, to the Surrealists, to uh, Duchamp. Uh, and there was a film society run by Amos Wogel, who came from Vienna uh, to New York uh, during the war. Uh, and he started Cinema 16 in 1950. I came myself to New York in 1950, <clears throat> and I attended all the screenings of Cinema 16. <laughs> and Cinema 16 showed, you know, the New York experimental avant-garde filmmakers, and also from those from San Francisco, and and also classics from the 20s and 30s from. France, Germany. Maya was only one of the filmmakers, though she was very active, pushing avant-garde film, uh, uh, mostly her own films, through the universities, traveling, persuading. Maya was very critical of the work of other filmmakers, and uh, some of the filmmakers <laughs> working in New York at that time uh, <laughs> did not like my that much, so uh, there were you know some fights. But of course she was friends with everybody and very active. And she organized the first series of uh, screenings of uh, avant-garde film in New York. On that series, Amos Vogel based his Cinema 16 society or club. Uh, he realized that there is enough audience after he saw what, that Maya Deren attracted in the Greenwich Village in New York. Mm, yes, my relationship with Maya was, I would say, very good from the very beginning for maybe a period of, maybe with the exception of a period of like two years or so when I wrote a very critical article on uh, uh, criticizing some aspects of the American avant-garde film. And she wanted to sue me <laughs> for it. And so for like two years between uh, like 50, in 57 and 58, we had very little contact. But then again, we uh, were, uh, became good friends to the very end of your life. In 1957, Stan Brackage made a film called Anticipation of the Night, Maya Deren. She disagreed, you know, I mean, a lot with what was beginning to happen after <coughs> around 57. <coughs> I should state, you know, I should just <coughs> maybe say right here, you know, <coughs> after I drink my beer. <clears throat> that although we call Maya Deren, very often we refer to her as our mother, the mother of the American avant-garde film. But you see, mother is one thing, but children is something else. And we are the children, the 60s generation. Brackage, when a young kid who came from Colorado to New York after making his first two, three films, Maya Deren gave her apartment to you know he stayed for two or three months but uh, in many other ways Maya totally disagreed and and disapproved what these her children were doing because Maya's films were <clears throat> very carefully scripted carefully scripted they were detailed incredible diagrams for every shot every angle of the shot, all the ideas that went into that shot, diagram after diagram, with <clears throat> anticipation of the night, a cinema is coming in, in which the improvisation, 
plays a very important part. All kinds of unpredictable camera movements, uh, unpredictable lightings, uh, uh, completely different film aesthetics, film language comes in. And my there and disapprove this immensely and vigorously and angrily. Uh, she did not take this as serious filmmaking. What did we have in other arts in America at that point? It, we have the Kooning, we have abstract expressionism. Mm -hmm. And what is the technique, what is the main attitude in abstract expressionism? There is this very concentrated improvisational aspect there, uh, immediate action. Uh, and that was transferred to cinema also during the same period. <clears throat> we have jazz, there are forms of jazz develop, Coltrane, where you know, know the, the notes, the blurs, the, uh, it's no lo longer just individual. Uh, uh, blurs across the strings and notes go, and that you have with the camera too, and around the same time. So the origin, it's in the air in all of the arts at the same time, but especially painting and cinema. While, you know, my Darren's cinema and Sidney Peterson, James Broughton, is still with very deep, I think, influences from the, from the 20s and cinema of the da from the Dadaists and Surrealists. One of the main writers, film critics of the period, Parker Tyler, who did some of the most intel intelligent writing on the cinema of the 50s, dismissed the new cinema as uh, incompetent, amateur, uh, not serious. Cinema 16 refused to distribute anticipation of the night. Cinema 16 considered that it was badly made, it's just no good, and they don't want to exhibit the film. Now, and we consider that this was, the, was a very exciting new beginning of something. So we felt that if Cinema 16 doesn't want to distribute anticipation of the night, we have to create our own distribution center. So we got together and we established a filmmakers cooperative. Not only filmmakers cooperative, but also an organization called New American Cinema Group. And filmmakers cooperative was only one of the activities of the New American Cinema Group. That's where the new cinema begins, after Maya there. Maya there, cover close, the rest, the new cinema comes in. We thought that we are ready uh, like to proceed two fronts. There are those uh, who are making uh, experimental, avant-garde films that are not for the mass distribution. And then there were others like Shirley Clark, Emil D'Antonio, Lionel Rogozin, Kasevitis, uh, Peter Bogdanovich, they wanted to make feature-length narrative films on low budget, and this organization uh, would look for funds and money and help, and we will be all together, and we'll be distribute our films together, and this is the new American cinema. What happened during next two, three, four years was that the more commercially minded uh, filmmakers decided that they don't want to stay with the avant-garde experimental filmmakers, that that may uh, restrict their distribution. They thought at that time that their films will have very wide appeal and will be very successful and they will go for Hollywood. So they did not stay with the filmmakers cooperative, but they went looking for other larger, bigger distributors. What they did not realize that the films they were making were the subjects and the way they were making them on real locations, uh, a good number of aspects 
of their filmmaking did not appeal to wide audiences and they never succeeded getting wide audiences. The distributors that took their films never did anything to promote them because they could not promote them. While the avant-garde filmmakers, experimental filmmakers, stuck together and the cooperative grew, the films went to the universities and film societies. Even in the time perspective, uh, I have told myself this, we have argued with Lionel Rogers and Shirley Clark and good number of them, betrayed the, the co-op and the movement because if they would have remained with the cooperative, the cooperative would have a different image and I think people would have come and rented their films and they would have been successful. Um, I wouldn't call it greed but misled uh, hopes that our films are for everybody, uh, really destroy them. While we, at the very beginning, the avant-garde filmmakers, we knew and insisted, and I insisted repeatedly, saying that, that repeatedly I said and wrote that our films, of course, are for limited audience by their very nature, by their form, by their subject, and we are not trying to reach everybody. Uh, same as the difference between po poetry and prose. Prose is published in millions of copies. Ezra Pound, even today, is published in 3,000 copies. So it is not the same, and we have no pretensions, though it's not exactly like Gregory Markopoulos, and even Brackage at some times thought that, that his films could be maybe going to all of the theaters and people would appreciate and like them. It is not uh, true, oh, that never, of course, um, happened because that is an, an impossibility. What I like about Shadows, see, what got me excited is so-called the first version of Shadows. And the, what the first version was, was about two hours long film, like, which was a totally improvised, there was like a li little idea given, you know, that this scene will be about that and that, now you do it. And the actors improvised, and also the camera like improvised, and it was very free and very loose, uh, like it connected to jazz, it connected to the sensibilities that were in beat generation. It was very contemporary, and very real and very fresh. And also was, I thought real gave possibilities to new kind of uh, narrative cinema. But a month or two months later, <clears throat> a French filmmaker producer by the name Nico Papatakis came to New York and he saw the film and he thought he, it's terrific, but it's not professional enough. Uh, he uh, it's too amateurish. He would like you know to distribute and this is great, but. Uh, it should be made more professional looking and let's, why don't we reshoot it? Why don't we reshoot that part and that? And they started reshooting and they redid the film and uh, reduced to about one hour and a half. And those scenes already became less improvised. They were already forced and, and, uh, and sort of dramatized and became a completely different film. Still, it contains some of those elements and it still has been received and liked by many, and that is still very fresh, but they have no idea what the first version was like. It, it's, uh, Kesevitis refused to show it. He, uh, after, when the second version was produced, then he went to uh, Hollywood and started on this independent sort of Hollywood producing other films. And uh, I asked him many late years later when he sort of forgave, me. and you know, I really attacked him, you know, so uh, he was angry and did not talk to me for like 10 years. Then, you know, we became, we started talking again, and I asked one day if he still, uh, if there is the first version anywhere. He said, no, it doesn't exist. Now, we don't know. The subject is still sensitive, even after so many years. 
still the aspect of the, that it's low budget, just made by unknown actor that one can make a film on f with ten thousand dollars and that of course inspired Robert Frank to make Pull My Daisy and many others uh, uh, went into cinema because of that. To those who wanted to make longer narrative films of slightly different kind, let's say more personal narratives, it was of, uh, of, uh, of importance. It did not deal with some big uh, subjects, but it dealt with uh, 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 nuances of real you know, life, blacks and whites in poor families. So it, it, it's uh, uh, like more kind of democratic kind of cinema. And uh, that, telling the truth, did not really pick up and did not develop <laughs> much either. <laughs> uh, did not have great influence. Strangely enough, we noticed that <clears throat> some of the films, important landmarks like that, same as uh, some of Andy Warhol's work, we think that then, you see, it will be so, such inspiration that everybody will pick up and follow it in their own way. That doesn't happen, really. Um, Because when Andy Warhol was making his films in the early 60s with very little money and just putting his camera there and people in front of the camera performing and doing this and that, then everybody thought that, ah, oh, now everybody can make movies like that. And that, even I thought so, that there will be a whole movement of, uh, 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 of that kind of cinema. That did not happen either. Uh, so. Um. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one can talk about avant-garde and keep repeating avant-garde that this is avant-garde filmmaker and he is and she is. And, but at some point it becomes uh, a little bit senseless. One wants to talk more about the different forms of cinema. In the first place we have cinema, and then within that cinema we have different individual filmmakers, same as we have literature and we have writers. Now some of those writers are prose writers, some are poets. They use slightly different forms of literature. Same with filmmakers. I mean, some filmmakers use narrative forms, other more uh, non-narrative forms. But at the very end, it is cinema. We were talking, talking about cinema, cinema, cinema. So when we talk about Andy Warhol, um, Andy Warhol's film education uh, took place totally among the avant-garde independent you know, filmmaking community. I mean, we created Filmmakers Cooperative in 61. And we moved Filmmakers Cooperative into my law, into my living and working place. So at, I had one, at the one end of the law, I put some separation partition, and that's where I had my editing, uh, my viewer, and my, and that's where I slept, and I ate, and I lived. And the rest was taken over before I knew by strangers, by the filmmakers' cooperative. Now, every day, every night, uh, filmmakers used to come and screen. That was one place at that time, in 62, 63, where, uh, Films were screened, they finished shooting, that's when Jack Smith screened every night. So after he finishes shooting, he rushes, he brings his new footage and he screens and everybody comes in and, and, um, and then they talk and they smoke and they... So one of the filmmakers um, said, you don't know Andy Warhol? I said, no, I don't know, who is it? 
that he has been sitting in your loft all this time and watching all those movies and you don't know and no I don't know too many people come and you know they watch and then I, I cannot keep track of them so he has been sitting and watching and watching that was his education and that's where he began then he decided that he will make my films himself now some of the ideas of these films now to run without stopping so that the idea was already in the air from uh, and of course uh, some poets like Jackson McClough had written little scripts to so film a tree for six hours uh, George Lando already around the same time and Andy admired George, early George Lando's films very much uh, was experimenting already also with longer takes in music at that time during the same period Lamont Young gave concerts of one note performed stretched to four five six hours so it, it's not totally invention of Andy Warhol the idea of the long sustained shot uh, scene uh, was already in the air from, you know, other arts, but he put it into practice. Of course, uh, Empire, we did not have the camera that would run for six or eight hours, so it was in 30 minute shots, <laughs> but um, I was the cameraman on that. Uh, but it already was closer to one continuous um, take. I mean, there were like three periods. One is the silent, totally silent period, which is uh, Andy Warhol with nobody's influence, that's pure Andy Warhol. The second period when he used to permit anybody who came into his loft and all kinds of sad creatures used to come from across the country and uh, to his loft, he permitted them to express themselves and with some, you know, sometimes an idea was thrown in, into the situation, act the situation, very much like a it is. But sometimes, okay, you are there, just do now whatever you want. And there the camera is running. So a series of films were produced that way. Then the third period when um, uh, Paul Morrissey comes in as his assistant and already begins to shift towards uh, uh, sort of Hollywood dream, the more controlled situations and scripts came in and, uh, and that's real when Andy Warhol's cinema ends and Paul Morris's cinema begins. Warhol became like MGM, like the producer, though very often his name, uh, those films were distributed under his name, though were absolutely Andy Warhol had nothing to do with them. All filmmakers in New York knew poets and painters, but I think that the uh, relationship and the result of that was stronger in the 20s in Paris, for instance, than in New York. In Paris, the, some of the painters or photographers, let's say, uh, produced some very important films like Ballet Mechanique or Man Ray. While in New York, we knew each other, I guess maybe we influenced each other, but the 60s generation, whatever important was created in cinema, was created by, oh, that already begins in the 50s, uh, by filmmakers, those who were interested in nothing else from the very beginning but cinema, cinema, cinema. Several painters tried and made some film, but they were not very important. Um, I mean, Oldenburg and Rauschen were, ex with the exception of course of Andy Warhol. But those were marginal, not very uh, influential, not uh, as monumental as ballet mechanique. The same with the poets. Some of the, the poets, a good number of them, uh, made films. But the best of the poets, uh, 
did not make <laughs> best of films. And Brackage, uh, for instance, or Maya Deren, was very close to the best of the painters and best of the poets. Frampton was very close to Ezra Pound, and Brackage credits all the time, gives credit to Olson and to Gertrude Stein for his inspiration. Jack Smith, of course, was, his films were, had very strong impact, but they were not seen very much. And uh, the less one saw his films, uh, the more his, like a legend of him as a character, as a grew. I think that he influenced maybe more people by his very uncompromising position and his way of life and behaving than with his films. I think Flaming Creature is a very important film, but uh, Jack Smith had great influence on New York theater, performing arts, and of course cinema. Just by being Jack Smith, one who can make anything in any situation to give form and shape to anything, uh, of course, that's one could say extension, uh, the champ aesthetics people use just to come see, you know, Jack Smith's apartment as a work of art. Actually, after Jack Smith died, Flaming Creatures was finished only by uh, by Tony Conrad, who is a filmmaker. But at that point, he was only a musician, and he was living in Jack Smith's loft at that time. It was he who decided to put the uh, roles that Jack Smith filmed together and put the soundtrack. And he selected the music with some help from Jack Smith and he finished the film. There is another one, little one, three minute film, Scotch tape that was finished by, practically by Ken Jacobs. All his other films, No President or Normal Love, he like finished, put them together and screened. I screened them myself, but with Jack always uh, being there and supervising. And then he took them home and uh, then he said, no, uh, I should do something else with it. And he, he took them up, uh, he took all those films apart and again put in a different order. And next time he screened, you saw them in completely different order, dif with different records, different music, uh, different films. Con they did not change that much essentially because that no matter how, um, in which order some of those reels you put, still the same mood, the same imagination comes through. But he kept changing and changing, changing, and there he, for, uh, I mean, Normal Love was shot in like 64, somewhere there, kept changing to the, until he died. It was, he could not finish. He could not finish anything. It was, everything was in process, in progress, and uh, uh, in some way that was inspira inspiration for others. You know, that's like a living theater, constantly changing even in theater. That, you know, for those who love film and would like to rent and show, <laughs> then it doesn't help because then you cannot project them. Now. The same with even Flaming Creatures. He, uh, uh, fortunately, Anthology got one print from Jack that was original, the way it was originally made. But then he started fooling with that also. He decided that he doesn't want to show Flaming Creatures the way it is anymore. And he made another print with a very contrasty film that is used usually to make titles only, which is, becomes very abstract kind of film. And he thought that he would, would like to show that. Then, only uh, like six or seven months before he died, New York Festival was asking me what should, they would like to show last year, something to, from the independents. So I said, hmm, time. Now, of course, there was a time when Flaming Creature was forbidden, and I went twice to jail for it myself. But 
uh, now why don't you show it? That would be a very important event. They said, hmm, it's a good idea. So they go to Jack Smith. Jack Smith, oh, he says, terrific, good, I would like to, to be shown in a large theater, in a festival, but I would like to colorize it, to colorize it. He will give to those companies that colorize black and white films. He wants to show it in color. So, and then he died, and so it was never shown, but they showed it this year the way it was originally made. So, uh, nothing was ever, you know, finished for Jack Smith. A lot was happening, at, you know, in the, in 67, 68. It was my idea that, my thought that, you know, all this footage collected by some documentary filmmakers here and there in various cities about the political activities. Somehow there should be some central place. So in December of, um, of 67, I called all the New York area uh, sort of politically minded filmmakers and I said, why don't we create a newsreel kind of group? And when they had no film, one night with a truck we went to a television station and we unloaded we took uh, enough black and white and color film uh, that uh, a truckload that supported the new york and detroit and san francisco uh, newsreel people for with film even the titles of the first newsreel were design, designed by george mcchun as a fluxus and some of the people like Leroy Jones or, or um, Robert Kramer, we traveled with those early newsreels together through universities and we thought this is a unique like, combination. We, uh, this may be between the documentary, political filmmakers and the more formalistic avant-garde. But that did not last very long. After a few months, uh, I felt I had to pull myself out some other members of the, the, the group felt that they did not want to be associated too much with uh, uh, the avant-garde film line. So that it's the same as what happened in the early Soviet Union and then maybe after the revolution for maybe two or three years there was some avant-garde, you know, but then later they kicked them out. Actually, the, the very first three or four months, the first seven or eight newsreels that uh, we issued uh, had a very special dynamic. And then later they just became very regular, routine uh, political films. What my generation is, I don't know, really. <clears throat> but, re but in cinema, really, the generation that I was really involved in and I knew very well was the 60s generation. When you get that deeply and totally involved to such, uh, in such intensity, uh, that cannot last, you know, that long. Every movement in the history of art, when you look, movements like that don't last very long. I think that there, that there was something very special between 1957 and 67. That is between the uh, anticipation of the night and wave, wave Michael Snow's nose wavelength. That's where it more or less embraces 10 years. Something very intense happened there and, and after that it's like classical period, continuation. So uh, my responsibility and my interest mainly, you know, is in protection. The work of that generation survives and is seen by everybody who will come after us. Until 1966, <clears throat> the only person who ever got any money from a foundation was Maya Deren. Maya Deren got a grant from Guggenheim, Guggenheim Foundation. And that was very unique because uh, all, everybody else made their films with the, by working somewhere, by stealing, by not paying the labs, by doing anything. 
And the main body of the American cinema, avant-garde film, of that generation was created from like nothing. Uh, <clears throat> after 1970, there are state councils on the, on the arts established in every state uh, in the United States, and the national uh, national endowment for the arts is created in Washington. And every year, there are about 400 grants given to American film and video makers. Now, this grant system uh, made filmmakers and video makers dependent on those grants. You find a filmmaker like okay, Paul Sharitz, uh, who has, you know, I said, Paul, what are you doing? Uh, are you making something new? No, I did not get a grant this year, he said. I, I'm not doing that. I don't know why I did not get so that in the 50s and 60s, nobody would, that would be ridiculous. I mean, you want to make a film, you, you make a film. You just borrow a camera, you, you borrow, uh, you work somewhere for a day or two, or uh, you buy a roll of film and you may get friends together and you make a film. Now he's not making a film because he did not get a grant. This dependence on grants is one thing I think that affected very, very badly American avant-garde film movement. The other one was that uh, one sh would think that it's terrific, it's very good that cinema, film, is being taught in universities and colleges. Imagine how many film students uh, are being produced every year, but I know because I'm suffering uh, from them, from I get hundreds of their films to see and their videos to see. And these are academic imitations, imitations of Brackage, of Frampton, of Peterson, of Maya Deren, uh, this academic cinema. Um, that's another disaster that uh, we have today in American independent our God cinema. I did not choose it. I did not choose it. It chose me. <laughs> no, <laughs> As I said, I would if if it would be up to me, uh, all I would like is to sit in some bar and drink some beer, or lie under a tree and enjoy the nature and look at the sun and sing with friends and do nothing and be happy. But it doesn't happen. You meet friends. They say, I'm making a film. Uh, and uh, I, I, there is no way of showing. Say, really, there is no way of showing. I must help you. So I get involved in, you know, in screening. That oh, my film is falling to pieces. I don't know what now. It's really falling to pieces. You have to get some money you now to preserve. And, no, I am. I cannot get. You know, okay, then I will try to get some money. So I get involved in preservation. Uh, and uh, as and then of course uh, the filmmaking itself. You know you. Uh, it's contagious, you know, get camera, you can shoot, shoot, and uh, I, I really don't know how I got involved in it. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, in some ways one knows, one begins to see films, then one, one reads something, one gets excited and wants to, so, uh, I just at some point, you know, I just wanted to do it myself, especially after reading the Frank Stauffacher a book called Art in cinema, that was around 1915, that had little essays by the early Dadaist Sirir on essay on my there, and, and that was very inspirational book to many of us. As soon as I landed in America in November 49, I rented a camera, Bolex, and I started. I did not know much about the avant-garde film. I did not know it, nothing, I did not know that it existed. My first need in, was I should document the life of immigrants, of the displaced, displaced persons. 
I was very angry, I remember, around 48 somewhere, and I saw a film, by, uh, I think it was made by Fred Zinnemann, called The Search, um, which dealt with the displayed persons in, after the war, and I thought it was naive and ridiculous, and it did not really show how it really is. So I thought, I will show them how it really is. So that's why I began documenting the life of immigrants community in Brooklyn, in New York, and that's all that early footage you see in Lost, Lost, Lost. When I came to New York, so I had missed during the war and post-war years, I, miss, I missed like a decade of the cultural life of this civilization. <clears throat> so I wanted to catch up immediately with everything. We, myself, my brother, we did not miss in New York any theater perf performance, any film, any new film, any screening anywhere. We, and in ballet, and we attended absolutely, like for two years, everything. Like, In any case, that's how one is caught in it. 